Um, just talking about like training this and taking this onto you know into our training environments. What are some uh, exercises that you like to train the the front three in in regards to the different phases? So, do you have like you know your your go to exercises for the attacking phase or or for even for pressing? Are there, are there some like favorites that you have? It's very important that um, <laughs> probably a lot of players looking at that maybe our young players. They just want to play football, don't they? So they yeah. gotta just make sure players aren't bored, you know. And and that's that's the thing. You have to give them excitement. You have to understand the game, but you have to understand why you're doing it, mm -hmm. uh, the because, the why, and what it's going to lead to. Basically, you you maybe get a kid that comes through the ranks and go, I just want to score. But they have to understand the the selflessness that comes with it. So yes, there are different things that I like to do, but it's implementing a strategy. So you might do a small sided game and cut players off in the final third so they know to stay high, they know to stay wide. So that would be marked areas would be a good thing to do, in my opinion, mm -hmm. marking off. Um, for me, one thing that a uh, different managers or, or myself have done over the years, it's just kind of um, allow players to play, to understand the role, and then pretty much just explain why you did this after. Yep. It's imperative, in my opinion, to not only have the front three just – training maybe on their own doing shooting practice that's great and there's a time and a place for that but i think you have to link them up to what's going to happen a game you know i would have the full backs in i would have the central attacking midfielder joining them as well i'm basically trying to replicate um games yeah and um, that that's kind of how, how i try and see things so and mm -hmm. um, there's no one dimension again as i said you want players to be excited having people, once they do it, praise them quickly, give them that confidence, let them know they're doing well and you want to see that replicated in the game. Try, basically just trying to replicate game time as much right. as possible would be something I would do. And as for the characteristics of the forwards, would you look to encourage them to be more, um, in terms of their game intelligence, would you look to encourage them to be more like defensively minded because of the, you know, we've spoken well, you, in this presentation, the first part of it, well, a lot of it was about the defensive side of things. So would you, you know, encourage them to be more defensively savvy game, um, game aware on that side of things, or it's, would you say, you know, go play, be creative, do your thing in the attacking phase? It has to be both. It's, um, it has to be both the games attacking and defending these days, you know, when I, when I was a kid growing up, you know, you just think about attacking, you think about hitting the back and that you think yeah. about celebrating and, you know, day one, whenever I, I turn pro, you're quickly told to defend, you know, so it's, it's imperative. You have both. I don't want to take away from anybody's flair, anybody's creativeness. I think that's so good to do. And I think one, what I talked about just prior there was once you do have a, a plan for training, go and do the shooting practice, go and do the, the creative side of things, make sure that they are truly themselves because they have to be themselves once they go on the field, if it's a 1v1 or 2v2, whatever position, but they have to understand there's a structure in place. Again, you see the top managers will take their take their player off if need be, it doesn't matter who they are. If they're not doing the defensive side of thing, you know, you're going to get caught out. And you see now in the modern day game, the fullbacks are probably as I say, so important. That means our two inside forwards have to be tracking. And it is, it's part of the game. And that's, it's so hard to get those players and the top teams can afford them. They're gold dust. <laughs> um, but it is, un unfortunately for a striker, you have to defend if that makes any sense. But uh, it's just, it's imperative. You have both attacking and defending, crucial. The higher up you go, it's just, you can't get away from it. <laughs> and then we've um, just touched on it there with fullbacks. Do, um, with now, like we spoke about Andy Robertson and Trent Alexander, um, how how important are they in in terms of allowing the inside forwards to have that um, take up those positions in the central areas? Like we've seen fullbacks who maybe don't go fully into the attacking third b before, maybe pre two thousand and ten, but yeah. now we've now we've seen that and it's allowed like these these forwards in the key areas. So how important are the fullbacks in in that regard? Yeah, definitely. And, and why I talk about the fullbacks is I'm trying to show that it's because of the front three, really, because of their intricate movements. That allows the rest of the team to get higher up the pitch and be more dominant, which creates more chances for the attacking front three. So with their good movement, with their style, it allows the fullbacks, once they go inside, you're going to have a, a team that's maybe lesser ability. They're not 
going to switch on sometimes. They might switch off and follow track that runner or the midfield runner hasn't gone with them. And that's the hardest play. That's the hardest play to defend. I've seen it over the years, Messi coming deep. Yeah. You know, you everybody can watch him on TV. It looks easy to an extent, but it's the most difficult thing. Once someone's running the opposite way against a defender, you're kind of going, who picks him up? Should the defensive midfielder? That allows the wing backs to get forward. That allows a high press again. And again, there's numbers around the ball. Then once you've got the two full backs up as well, there's extra bodies around the ball to try and win back straight away. Yep. Brilliant. Okay, question has come in. Uh, Thomas, you explained the roles and responsibilities of the front three and individual forward play very clearly. Uh, in your opinion, is the future forward of the game a player who contributes more in all phases of the match, attacking and defending in transition, or rather an expert only in attacking? The game changes all the time. I, I, there's no way I can give you a, a yes to that at the minute. It, it, it's the way it is right now. But again, the game the game changes all the time. When I first got into football, it was a 4-4-2, it was a 4-5-1. Yep. The striker was a completely different, you know, even as a smaller frame, I was meant to be a target man as well in my own, own way. So, um, and then a different manager had me run them behind. So different things, but it's all about trying to build the consistency of keeping the ball in the final third. So if you can have more... Now, not every team has to have it. The quality is on different players, and that's that's so important. If you can win a game, Atletico Madrid have played 4-4-2 for a number of years, believe in that as well. And um, if you can just get whatever quality out of your team and get them understanding, again, as I said, it's subjective. So if you can go and if the goalkeeper pumps the ball long and someone runs a man and scores, I can't tell them off for that, you know. Um, but the more consistency we can bring to a game of football – that's when you dominate possession. That's when you get more chances. And that's probably when you see the players getting more and more goals and more and more assists. And you see the flair players coming out. Um, like we talked about the fullbacks getting hired. So I can't just answer, as I say, as a striker. I, at the minute, it looks good. Um, in five years, could there be something else? I would say there probably will be in something. But right now, I'm enjoying the front three, the rent good play. Um, if you want to talk about maybe a team doing something different, Liverpool might have to come up with something different now just because of the way they are. And I don't think it's so much to do with the front three. I think it's just the problems they've had over the season, the confidence though, but they might have to do something different with the forward line right now. Um, but I'm excited to see what will happen because at some point teams figure each other out. Um, and right now uh, there's a, there's a new uh, cumulus of players coming through, you know, Mbappe shining now, uh, Haaland shining now. You've got one who's an inside forward predominantly who scores goals. You've another one who's just an out and out striker, but can you know run the channel as well. So it's exciting to see, but the game's always changing. So that's the best thing to answer. I think that's a good question to open up to everybody. Is um, about Liverpool. Maybe if if you were in their, if you were in Klopp's shoes, what might be something that you think about introducing into into the training or into the team? to get them out of the slump because yeah. you know as we've been speaking they've been excellent and consistent as well for the last few years but now they need something different it seems so it'd be interesting to just open up to everybody what you what you guys would do thomas what would you, what would you think to do yeah definitely um it's it's a difficult one as well because the, it's hard to criticize a team that's been so so good for the last few years it's hard to criticize a manager that's been so good and so good with the players and you can see that i really believe it's been a crazy year with how to having fans and stuff that's definitely played into play again yep. touching on that but then you do have the injuries they're you know stricken with that um but they do have enough quality in my opinion to be beating quite a lot of teams and then we're sitting pretty in the league um i think it's a big confidence thing and, and players strikers get confidence from scoring goals or or winning games and and that's a, that's maybe underestimated in the game you know confidence of a player getting the armor in the shoulder and top's good at that but in my opinion, it's just getting back to basics now. It's just trying to get the confidence back up. Probably keep training simple. Don't don't complicate things. Um, they've been great for three or four years, you know, and dominant in every in every area. Maybe they're a little burnt out. Maybe they need one or two signings to freshen things up. Other teams have caught up with them. That's what happens in football. Um, again, you the Liverpool people people will be caught up with them a wee bit. You Barcelona, who in my opinion dominated for ten years. 
they're not the same team. Not to knock them, but it's just the way it goes with football. There's generations come, and, and if they want to do something different, they might have to change their tactics up even for the yeah. game later. So um, it's it's just imperative that they keep believing in, in potentially how they play or else they maybe just have to change one or two things up and go, all right, well, what's the best we can achieve this year? Mm. And then try and target that. Yeah, fair play. Um, on the idea of false nines, and uh, we spoke about Firmino at the start, what sort of characteristics, what I'm, I'm guessing more like psychological uh, characteristics, would you look for to make a good false nine if you're going to play with that in your front three? Yeah, I am, I, I am a deep believer of, Again, and Firmino's kind of fallen into that category. He doesn't score as much goals as people maybe want him to. Yeah. But he's been pivotal in Liverpool's success. And without him, it's not the same. It just doesn't tick the same way. So you're talking about someone who's technical. Um, you're talking about someone that has good vision, has good movement, good link-up play. Um Obviously, he's very fit and can play in that role. You need, you know, you need him to, to play as many games as possible during the season. Um, intelligent with his runs, late runs into the box. I think <clears throat> too many midfielders miss out the 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 number nine, the false nine, or the the late run. You see so many goals coming from that late late player coming into the box, and it's it's uh, he's almost playing like an attacking midfielder then. And um, you look, it's not the defenders. But maybe yes, the defender maybe should have called it, but it's more more so more often than not, it's the midfielder not tracking back. So there's so many different qualities, but again, Brendan Rodgers missed out on maybe playing for Medio in that false nine when he was manager of Liverpool. I think he uh, played him more as a, a wide player and it didn't get the same out of him. But again, they had different players to in their team as well, like Coutinho at the time as well. So um it just shows you how one player can just fit. A unique position and make a team just evolve you know and uh, maybe players thought whenever Coutinho left they were maybe on the downward not downward spiral but like um lacking something and they uh, certainly in in many ways Firmino stepped up and yep. uh, it was absolutely pivotal in the success they've had definitely yeah it's funny how yeah you mentioned Rogers he actually had Firmino didn't he brought him over but it's not until he found his position in that false nine really that he's we've seen him as like a he's almost made that position his own really in recent totally, years totally and I think teams are now trying to see that a uh, Man City um probably as well you, you players I wouldn't say they're maybe as false nine as Firmino he's probably the most renowned false nine there is but um Players can play in that role. Aguero can come short. He's technically gifted, you know, but his first thought is probably scoring a goal, whereas Firmino isn't. Yeah. But again, they have such a such a good team. They have their characters. They press well as well. And I'd say over the last few years, it's been between probably Man City and especially Man City now and Liverpool who dominated with the false nines, if you like. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. All right, good question coming in here from Ruth. Might be actually more of a comment. So, uh, in terms of Liverpool struggling to score and winning games, do you think it has also has to do with the fact that they are not fast and confident in defence, and perhaps should play defending in a lower block instead of keeping play, uh, instead of keeping playing the same way they were doing uh, when Van Dijk was playing? Yeah, no, brilliant question, and I agree. I fully agree with you. That's that's why I've illustrated some of these, and I've kept it on at the end. Playing out from the back is crucial these days and not everybody can do it. I don't believe the players that they brought in, in my opinion, are good enough. Liverpool mm -hmm. signed them and believed in them, but it's a big, big task to come from, you know, having a 80, 90 million pound world signing in Van Dijk to someone else. Just And there's a lot of pressure on that. that um, I probably, in my opinion, would have kept Fabinho and Henderson. Yes, it weakens the midfield, but the players that have been there know it and can play there from time to time I would have kept that I do think they need to change things they, they probably tried to play their way too much uh, the same and, and it's just different um, that's why when I say one player like Firmino moving into that position makes a world of difference to the team so you can imagine what that must be like for the opposition running at albeit a weaker centre half you know it's, it just it gives them more hope uh, if trust in players is key as well yeah and having the confidence in players and confidence in their team knowing when they're going to pass knowing if they can they've probably worked on things in training maybe certain things didn't go well and it's just maybe given 
the front three for if you like you know the little bit of concentration or the mindset of oh this isn't going to come to me potentially um but yeah great question i think it's great to try plan out from the back and, and believe in what you're doing but if they're going to restamp their authority on things i think they need to maybe change a few things up and tweak tweak their system and um right now it's not working for them no yeah. yeah fair point okay um i had a comment or question so uh harland he's not a false nine but he's flying right now right so he's more of your traditional almost 90s type of forward yeah. what if if you had to you probably uh, probably lean on the side of the false nine but if you had to argue for the case of the harland type of player the traditional number nine what would that case be what are some like arguments for having that player in your as your nine instead of a false nine um I don't want to say he's a false. He's, he's if if you want to say he's a false nine, he would be the perfect false nine because he can do both. I think he's that good. Okay. I think, I think he can do both. I think his link up play is exceptional, but he's a out and out. I think he is a wonderful, wonderful player. I think he's going going to dominate between him and Mbappe over the number of years. I think there's going to be uh, that's going to be a good race to see who <laughs> gets goals and 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 plays like that. But I just whenever I touch on false nine. He's not a false nine in terms of like that. He doesn't try and just sit in the hole. He's a goal scorer, but I believe he can play and operate any of the front three. He's that good. Yeah, I watched him last night and he was exceptional. His power, his pace. He just wants to score. He just looks like that kid on the playground that just wants to go and yeah. score. Just Whenever I. Billy's with the younger kids. Yeah, but um, as I said, false nine in terms of if he drops deep, he's got Sancho, he's got someone on the outside, or Royce as well. Who can make those inner channel runs? But a lot of his play is staying centrally hmm. and trying to make those runs in between the the defenders. And he's so powerful at it. His timing and his movement is exceptional. Yeah. I, again, I can't beg him up, up enough. But he's the perfect number nine these days, I think, in my opinion. Hmm. But he's got the attributes. Again, it's a big statement, but I think he's got something of each of the top players over the last number of years. Brilliant. Yeah. The, the, my question was on like the, the differences between, so he's like your number nine, you're, you're like almost your poacher. Whereas yeah. someone like um, Foden or Firmino or Messi back in the day is more of your false nine. Yeah. So what would be the arguments for having, for choosing uh, like a traditional poacher, like a Haaland or Aguero versus your, your false nine? What are the, what are the kind of some of the considerations we as coaches must make if we had the choice yeah. of those two type of players in our okay. team? Okay, so I, I would, at the minute, um, it, once a team's winning and scoring goals, you don't really want to change from that. Mm. So that's a big, big thing. So um, it becomes tricky whenever you lose a game. That's whenever you have to make big decisions. But whenever the team's winning, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It's kind of like a thumb rule that players and coaches like to use. But again, we all know that's not going to happen forever. But for me... For example, Haaland playing in a front three, you just know he's going to create chances himself and score goals more so than the false nine, probably, because he's looking to assist. Yep. And I do believe there's goals from the wide players as well in the typical front three roles these days. So for me, I would have a Firmino poacher style, probably more so than the front three. But what I've spoken about is predominantly what teams are doing these days trying to create that false nine. Mm -hmm. But I just think a player that good, in my opinion, I'm putting him in starting. He's the first name on the on the team sheet every every week because he's probably the first one that's going to score <laughs> and the last one to score. Yeah. Um I think he worries defenders probably more so because no defender wants to be running towards their own goal. Um that's a key strength of uh, a forward. Mm. Um but the consistency of a false nine to dominate possession and, and it's an argument for every, everybody it really is and again because it's so subjective do you want that consistency of being able to keep the ball in the final third or do you want to potentially go with a goal scorer goals win games uh, and it's 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 a tough one but again I believe the likes of Haaland because he, he doesn't do it all the time but he can come short and he's technically gifted I would go for him in my team or someone like him just that can change the game in an instant, you know, yeah. and I'm not saying the false nine can, I just think they're, they're more inclined to try and build the team up a little bit more. Mm. Yep. Good stuff. 
<laughs> got a question here from Kaha. He says, Haaland is a mix of a Viking and a robot. <laughs> I agree. Um, okay, guys, we're going to wrap this up in uh, just a sec. So if you've got any last questions or comments, put them in. Uh, but Thomas, I wanted to ask you about the inside forwards because um, around the top of the decade, we had people like, um, well, we had, let's, let's talk about Bayern. We had Iron Robin and we had Frank Ribery on either side. So they weren't your inside forwards. They were out and out wingers who were like kind of getting chalk on the on the, on their boots, if you like. Yeah. So what what do you think are the some of the merits of having your forwards now inside, and as opposed to having them on, on in the wider areas? Yeah, I think um, first and foremost they both they scored quite a lot of goals. The Ribery's and the Robins, you know, yeah. Byron cutting inside. You know, they were very dangerous cutting inside, but. You knew what they were going to do time and time again, but it was so hard to deal with. But they also, they had that ability and, and you don't really see it as much. Again, it would be come from the fullbacks. Players like that getting to the byline and then chopping and bringing other players into the ball or maybe crossing the ball in. The, I think crossing of the ball has definitely come out of the game slightly more unless it's the fullbacks. You know, I don't think the wingers do it as much. Mm. Um, I think they're more inclined to keep linking the play up and try and look for the goals. I love the, the era of Robin Ribery playing where they could kind of do both. And, and I miss that probably from, from football. Um, last night, as I touched on earlier, Juventus were crossing the ball in time and time again from Cadrado, um, looking for the front three because the front three had to change the rules up slightly. But I'd love to see more and more players getting to the byline. But again, these players can do it. I just think they're more inclined the inside forward to try and like bring their fullbacks more into play. Mm. create an overload the the percentage rates are there that they can actually win the ball back higher up the pitch then it, it maybe creates the opposition to go long and then it's just a recycle of play so i do there's an argument for both yeah. I, I do miss one side it's, it's outstanding football but again that could come back you know right now this seems to be the the way the football is being played it's successful but then you're going to see something else probably in a few years. Yep. Yep. Just, just have to watch and see. Um, all right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in from uh, wherever you are, whatever you've been doing today, you made some time. So we appreciate that. Um, and Thomas, thank you so much for sharing all your, all your stuff and your insights um, from your career. We really enjoyed it. Um, so I'll leave the final word with you. Absolutely. No, thanks. Thanks for, for having me and uh, appreciate it. And hope that helps with uh, some of the coaches and best of luck to you all. Perfect. All right. Excellent. Take care, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thank you.